Hello, hello, welcome back to my channel. My name is Melanie Tana, and I love to talk about stories of all different kinds. For the past couple years, I've been talking about The Wheel of Time. I started about halfway through the series sort of summarizing what I've been reading and my thoughts on those things, and it's been really fun for me. So I am now on, well, I just finished book 13, so that's the second to last book. It's Towers of Midnight. So we left off with chapter 35 of book 13, and we're going into chapter 36. By the way, this is definitely a spoiler video. I can't really avoid spoilers at this point, but I will definitely give my summary thoughts of what I think of the series when I'm done without spoilers for those who are interested. In chapter 36, titled An Invitation. Egwene meets in Teleranriod to sort of make a deal with the wise ones and the sea folk about the women who can channel between the three groups of women, um, can kind of be sent to each other to train, to broaden their horizons, to not be so cut off from each other. It's a good idea for unity and it's a good idea for training purposes. Um, she also makes deals over like the Bowl of Winds, which was seen in a previous book the Terangrial. But at the end of the meeting, Swan appears in the dream to tell Egwene that the trap they've set up and been prepared for um, to catch Masana and other Black Aja has been sprung and it's time to fight. And then the end of the chapter, POV switches to Perrin as he decides he must kill Slayer, not just hide the dream spike, and he races to Tarvalon. So if you're not sure where we left off or you haven't watched my previous video, we left off with Perrin in the wolf dream with the dream spike, kind of running away to hopefully destroy it. Um, but in this chapter, he realizes it is not enough to just like throw the dream spike into the ocean. He's going to have to kill Slayer. He's not sure how he could destroy the dream spike. Um, so he runs toward Tarvalon, which is, you know, where Egwene is meeting and prepared to trap Missana the Forsaken. And we'll see how that goes. In chapter 37, it opens with Gawain realizing that Egwene must be in the dream world and therefore vulnerable to assassins. And he runs to a gateway from Camelon to Tarvalon, um, kind of after accepting that he's jealous of Rand and needs to get over it and he isn't the leader he thought he would be. He races toward the gateway um, to get to Tarvalon to protect Egwene because assassins are out for her specifically. Um, Egwene and the other Aes Sedai cannot leave the dream world for some reason. It's the dream spike's dome um, that's causing this. Perrin knows he cannot destroy the dream spike, but he sees Slayer eyeing Dragon Mount a little nervously, and so he just, you know, starts to engage Slayer and they fight. Gawain gets to Egwene's room with two former younglings with him, but they die at the hand of the assassins, and it is suddenly three on one, three assassins against Gawain. And these assassins are especially good with shadows, um, with playing with the darkness cast by light, and are, you know, just good at fighting in general. So they have that advantage. Other than the numbers, they are very, very skilled. Perrin and Slayer fight, and Slayer gains the dream spike while Hopper and Perrin chase after him. Egwene has been engaging with Black Aja, fighting them, but she's faced with Masana, and so she gets out of there, shifts to another room in the dream, and she realizes that there must be 19 Black Aja to match the 19 dream Terangriel that were stolen, those rings that they made to allow them to meet in the dream world that were stolen by the Black Aja previously. At some point, it's really cool, Perrin runs into Egwene um, and he stops a Black Aja's weave of balefire, basically deciding that it doesn't exist, denying its existence. And in the dream world, his will power to be like, that's not real, that won't affect me, defeats it, like makes it like not a problem. And he kind of interacts with Egwene for a second. He's like, what are you doing here? It's not safe. And he doesn't realize that she is the Omerlin. Like he's like, wow, she's doing so well, but I can't stay. And he chases after Hopper after he hears that Hopper is in pain. Gawain is sort of being worn down by the three assassins. He manages to take one out, but it's still two on one and he is tired and he is barely holding on, especially with their level of skill. And so he tips over a lantern to put it out and kind of plunges them into darkness. This helps him to even the playing field between them where they have no shadows to hide and they're all in complete darkness. That's what they have to work with. He takes out a second assassin and then um, basically doing sheathing the sword, that sword trick we saw in The Great Hunt with Rand. He takes a strike to the abdomen 
in order to defeat the final assassin. Um, but at the end of that moment, he falls unconscious. We cut to Masana, who wants the dream spike for herself. She realizes she and the other Black Aja cannot escape. She kind of changes her plan and she performs Weave on Katarine, if that's how I say his name, her name. Perrin and Slayer face off again. Slayer throws Hopper off of a building, but Perrin manages to catch him with his body. And then Slayer shoots an arrow through Hopper into Perrin's leg. Perrin, in that moment, sort of temporarily defeated, sees a nightmare and then pushes Slayer into it and follows him. Having previously thought in the other video I talked about, he was kind of realizing that maybe nightmares and his control of the dream world could help him defeat Slayer in the dream world. Going on to chapter 38, a lot is happening in these chapters. This was a weird place for me to cut the video, but I had to because of my reading schedule. So, we start off pretty intense already. Um, chapter 38 is no different. Um, Egwene is shifting around in Teleronriod, thinking on how people like Perrin are strong-willed and therefore powerful in the dream. Egwene tries to be less predictable with her moves um, and eventually surprises Misana, but kills a woman who is not Misana but Katarine. Basically, Misana put a leave on her face of like, looking like Misana. And it was very cool because Egwene like willed a spear forward. She's like, no, like, no one can stop the spear. And so she kills Katarine um, and then in a snap moment feels that autumn collar around her neck. Um, Masana is there to torture her, asking about the dream spike and Egwene is like, absolutely not. Um, she does what Perrin did. After panicking for a second, she remembers like, this is about willpower. I have the willpower. She refuses to believe that the autumn is real and it goes away. And then it becomes sort of a staring contest of wills between her and Masana. And I think this is such a great arc moment for Egwene. I like watching the characters deal with the Forsaken in a way that like completes um, a character arc for them. It's very cool. Um, Egwene does a really great job with this. I think this shows her conquering of the Adam better than the show did. If you haven't seen season two, no major spoilers, but they kind of rush her conquering of that. And I don't think they defeat her enough, which sounds bad, but like for character growth purposes, I think the book did this excellently. She's had the Adam before, she's been a slave before, and she couldn't save herself, but she saves herself now in the dream world, yes, but by willing the Autumn to not exist. During this staring contest of wills, as I called it, something snaps and Masana falls to the ground. Egwene takes Masana to her group and Masana is alive, but her mind is broken and one of the wise ones mentions that they've seen this before. Perrin and Slayer, um, are in a nightmare of the last battle of Tarmungaidan. Dragon Mount in the dream is erupting and Perrin uses the lava to destroy the dream spike. Slayer Man manages to beat him, but not before Perrin destroyed the dream spike, so we're good there. But Perrin hears Hopper in his last moments telling him to seek out Boundless. So Hopper is dead in the dream world and that is like dead dead. That is not you cycle back into the pattern, like you die and you're gone from the pattern. Um, and in his last, like, message to Perrin through his mind, he says, seek out Boundless, the wolf, Boundless, go find him. We cut to Egwene finding Gawain and realizing, um, that he has saved her. And so, in order to save him as he's unconscious and bleeding out, she bonds him as a warder and it helps heal him. Perrin awakes crying. It's really sad. I love Perrin. Perrin, written by Brandon Sanderson, is one of the best things to come out of these books written by Sanderson. Um... I really love his character and it gets even better, but Fael is there to be, like, be there for him. The Ashman heal him and they're sort of prepping the gateways, realizing that they can use gateways now because the dream spike was destroyed. And then there's a final scene with Slayer kneeling before Graindal, the Forsaken, and she's ordering a trap to be sprung, which we'll find out what that is later. We go to chapter 39, a little more mellow, but still very interesting. Avienda is on her way to Ruidian. Um, she meets a woman on the way named Nakomi. Um, Nokomi has like this mysterious effect on things um, and disappears without a trace after sort of talking with Avienda about the Aiel and their role and what their role will be after they fulfill their toe at Tarman Gaiden. And Avienda's thinking about like, without looking forward to the Dragon Reborn and all that stuff, what are we going to have? So chapter 40 is one of my favorites that I've ever read. It's called A Making. Basically, it opens with Perrin. He's mourning the loss of Hopper and still feels that something is wrong despite the dream spike being destroyed. Um, and so he goes to the forge to start working on things. He doesn't really know what he's going to make, but he starts like using different metals. Um, Niall starts using the one power, um, one of the Ashaman, 
asking the six wise ones and to Ashaman to link with him, just like getting a sense that like I'm doing something important. Um, Perrin th sort of, as he works, is thinking on his path to becoming a leader, realizing that he's forging a very large hammer. And at the end of forging the hammer, he hammers in the design of a leaping wolf on the side of it. As he creates this hammer, he realizes like, he needs to accept himself as a leader. He asks if they still have one of the wolf head banners, and they do. They kept them despite him telling his um, men to destroy them. Um, they kept one, and so he tells them to raise it, and he says, I will be your, your leader. Um, it's a really cool moment, and I love a magic weapon. It was very cool. He asks in the old tongue if anyone knows what he who soars translates to, um, and it's Mah... Ma'alenir. Ma'alenir? Ma, ma, ma hmm. Ma'alenir? Correct me if I'm wrong, but is it not a little Mjolnir-esque? And am I mad about it? No, not at all. I think it's sick. Um, but it's very cool and Berlin and Fail. And also Berlin was the one who knew what he who soars is in the old tongue. So she's a very educated, she's a very interesting person. I actually really like Berlin for some reason. But Berlin and Fael are discussing power wrought weapons and that Nailed must have had some talent for making them and so maybe he could make more. Um, Berlin is also convinced that Perrin is going to ambush the White Cloaks based on where he's telling everyone to go and where the gateways are um, being placed. And then Fael's like, you don't know my husband at all. He wouldn't ambush the White Cloaks. Like he just like had a trial with them and He's an honorable man, kind of realizing that Perrin and Berlin would have been an awful match. Perrin and Elias talk, Elias leaving with the wolves for the last hunt, and then it cuts to Galad believing that Perrin is ambushing them, kind of prepping for it, like, oh man, I'm trying to do the right thing, what's the right thing? This is obviously not working out, because he thinks Perrin's going to ambush them. But then Perrin tells Fael that he's actually trying to keep Galad alive. Like, not, Perrin's like, what do you, I'm not ambushing them, I'm saving them, but because Perrin is not a great communicator. They don't know that. Um, and also because he can sense things that others can't. And so basically they um, have the gateways go to like the hill above the white cloaks and they can't see in the darkness what Perrin is aiming for, but he's having his archers prepare to attack beyond the white cloaks where a Trolloc army is waiting. And that's where it ends. Archers like firing at the Trollocs in the distance. So it's pretty cool. In chapter 41, battle ensues. The white cloaks know the Trollocs are there. Byer, because he doesn't trust Perrin because he's annoying. He believes that Perrin brought the Trollocs. Perrin explains to Fael that they were being pushed to a trap by the Trollocs. And he figured it out just in time because he sensed something else was wrong. But he said he won't abandon the white cloaks um, to the Trollocs like the White Cloaks did to his men at the Two Rivers. Galad and his men are trying to fight the Trollocs, but Galad hurts himself and he's realizing like these men do not know how to fight like this. Like they are, we're all like, we knew that. They're lame. <laughs> they're, they're, they're horrible, horrible men, especially early on in the series. And they don't really know what they're doing. They're just a little mercenary organization that's never actually fought anyone. Like who wasn't powerless against them. So anyway, they don't know what they're doing. Galad kind of knows what he's doing, but he's very alone in that. Um, Perrin's caval cavalry rides down and saves Galad and his men. Perrin, in one particular moment, saves Galad um, and his hammer sizzles as, as it hits Trollocs, which is super cool. There's like a moment where Galad's talking with Perrin. He's like, I bet you think this will change the outcome of like your punishment for the trial. And Perrin's like, yeah, it better. <laughs> I love that because I thought it was so, like, it wasn't, like, the most honorable thing. Like, I accept whatever. He's like, no, yeah, of course it should. <laughs> That's not why I'm doing it, but it better. <laughs> like, come on, I'm taking a risk here for you, and you might be the reason that I die after the last battle. That's dumb. Um, it's very funny. And God's like, okay. And so his new punishment, or his, like, final punishment, um, is that he will pay 500 crowns to the victim's families that Perrin killed they determine in the trial, right? Um, and then he, you know, will fight like hell at the last battle. Be awesome. Um, Perrin's like, yeah, duh, that's fine. <laughs> like, it's funny. He's like, sure. Um, and then there, like, a final moment in the chapter when, like, the fighting has calmed down. Bayer tries to sneak up on Perrin to literally stab him in the back. And Bornald, who thought Perrin killed his father, but is realizing he was wrong, saves Perrin, basically saying that wasn't the honorable thing to do for Bayer to like sneak up on you like that. Um, despite the fact that Bornald does not love Perrin. 
but he's not crazy like Bayer was. So on to chapter 42, Gobbin and Egwene discuss the assassins. They sort of reconnect after everything happened because they're bonded as, you know, Mortar and Omerlin Aes Sedai, um, and they love each other. Um, also, she said she loved him, which helped. <laughs> um, he suggests that they get married, and she's like, are you crazy? I have to talk to my parents first, which is, like, so funny, because she's, like, some kind of queen, you being the Omerlin, and she's like, I have to talk to my mom and dad. <laughs> and there's a lot of that in this book, where I'm like, everyone's like, we have to get married, and I'm like, oh my gosh. And I, I'm, not, I'm not against marriage. That's not what I'm saying. But the way it comes about feels very, very cheesy, and for some people, very sudden. We will get to that as well. But... I like the romance. I actually think a lot of the pairings I'm like totally fine with, but I think it may not be everyone's final arc in a relationship to be like, okay, now we must wed. I'm like, okay, like that's fine. I don't really know what my feelings are exactly about it, but I just get a sense of like, now everyone's getting married and it's kind of cheesy, I think is the thing. And, and it just, in some cases, I don't think it's super necessary in the moment to be like, can you marry me? And I'm like, oh my gosh, can you get out of danger first? Can you get healed first? Like a lot of these people do, so. I don't know. Maybe I'm not as romantic as I should be about it, but I like the romance. I just don't like the immediate, like, okay, now we have to get married. I'm like, can you just talk about your feelings for a second? Can you remind me that you actually care about each other? Because Robert Jordan kind of just dropped this on me. So bless him. I love him. But anyway, but then <laughs> other important stuff. Gawain takes the dead assassin's rings, the Tarangriel rings for himself. They kind of blurred themselves and made them better assassins. We cut to Lan, who can sense that he's now bonded to Nynaeve. Um, he arrives at Silverwall, Silverwall Keep? Keeps? I don't know what I wrote down, but Silverwall. <laughs> and he meets uh, Carcel. Wow, did I write this badly? But he's basically an, a Kandori prince. And I feel bad that I like wrote this so badly. Um, who recognizes Lan by Mandarb, his horse, um, who Nynaeve was like, hey, look out for his horse. He's not going to tell you who he is, but look out for his horse. And so she got him that way. He's like, darn it, Nynaeve. And so now thousands of men are following him. And he raises the golden crane, just accepting, you know, that he can openly lead them and he can't really avoid it anymore because also destiny. Anyway, going on to chapter 43, Galad accepts healing from an Aes Sedai and, and also accepts Perrin as the commander over him in the White Cloaks until after the last battle. Chapter 44, Morgaze plans to make herself known to her daughter. She kisses Talonvor in this moment, and they decide to get married. Nayald is also forging more one-power weapons, including spears for the Aeol, which is super cool. And I love that idea. I want a power rot spear. At Linny's, is that how you say, say her name? Lini? I can't remember, but Morgaze is like old lady handmaid. I don't know. She, this is another thing. She's like, oh, you can't be kissing. You have to get married. I'm like, okay. Okay. Morgaze can do what she wants. How old is she? Like 40? She can do what she wants. Um, I don't know how old she is. She has adult children, so I don't know. But she's in love with Talonvor. Perrin um, weds them uh, <laughs> very abruptly and fails. Like, you will learn how to make it more ceremonial. We'll, we'll figure that out for you. <laughs> um... And then at the end, end of the chapter, Perrin runs into Matt. They hug, and Matt plans to meet at an inn with him in Camelin, and also warns Perrin that assassins are out for the both of them. In chapter 45, Elaine couldn't quite get into Teleran Riode, but she got word in her dreams from Egwene that Misana has been defeated and captured. While sorting out queenly duties, Elaine's trying to figure out how to rule Kyrian without making it like a secondary kingdom of hers, and also without upsetting too many people. And then Galad and Morghese show up, revealing that Elaine's mother, Morghese, is alive in the first place, um, and also expressing that Morghese is not, gonna con is not going to contest for the throne. Um, and then they update each other on different things that are happening between them, and Morghese is, like, defending Perrin like he's a good man. I know that he, like, seems like he's defying um, Andor, but he he got me here safely. He, he's a good man. It's revealed to Morghais that Rand is the father of Elaine's twin babies. Uh, and Morghais is like, but like, you know, Elaine, he's a man who can channel. Like, he's the dragon reward. And there's this really actually very nice quote, and I like, I mean, all the, all the women in his life see him this way, right? But like, in the way that they love him, 
but also recognize that he's just a person, she says, and still a man, just a man for all that is demanded of him. And you get the sense of that, poor Rand. But I, I don't know. I liked that quote. It felt like Stark and like, oh, yeah. Rand is like caring so much despite just being like a young man, like younger than me. And I think about that and I'm like, please don't. I don't want to be Tavarin. And then at the end of the chapter, Avienda observes Ruidian and how much has changed since Rand showed up and how the Aiel's lives have changed because of him. So, yeah. Chapter 46 is titled Working Leather. It's the point of view of Andral Gendald. He's an Ashaman who's pretty weak in the power, but really strong in like using and creating gateways. Um, he's working with leather at the Black Tower, and when he, whenever he uses the one power, like shadows creep up on him. But also, Logan appears to be missing, and people are acting strange in the Black Tower, and it's sort of a Logan versus time. Basically, they're just not together on things, and people are taking sides. There's like a tense moment that Andrew sort of calms down. We cut to chapter 47. Elaine, Perrin, and Fael meet. They make some political deals regarding his station and basically their boon for returning more gays. I hated the formality of this part. It was so hard. To, I was listening to the audiobook and I was like, oh my gosh, you guys are friends. One of my favorite things in like fantasy books especially is like when, and in and, and any story where this can happen, is when like the characters come back together. That's one reason I love Stranger Things so much is that I love when the characters like, oh, mysterious things are happening. We gotta find each other since we're the ones who know. I'm like you guys are the main characters and they're like, hello friend, we're both like 20 years old, but we have to negotiate terms because I'm offended that you became a lord to defend your people. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so annoying. It's just, it feels unnecessary to me and so tense, like, like so defensive from the get-go. And I know that that is like the game that they play, literally the game that they play, like capitalized T TM, the game. But like, it's so, <laughs> I can't, I don't like it. Just felt way too formal. It's not my thing. And I've seen them at like their lowest. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, get a grip. Um, maybe that's just mean, but I just don't love it. So that was kind of awkward. Um, but it cuts to Fortuona, aka Tuan. Um, she's planning to train Damani in traveling, capital T traveling, and also to attack the White Tower. She is crazy. I don't, I don't love Tuan either. I think Matt could do better than like someone who endorses slavery, but. But what, what do I know? It was really fun to read Matt and Perrin reuniting and talking with Tom. Um, they update each other. Tom is like, hey, Matt got married, which is funny. Um, they discuss opening Varen's letter and like the timing for it. And, and Matt's like, I'm not going to open it until after I get back from the Tower of Genjai. Um, and he explains to Perrin, we're going to save Moraine. She's alive. So super cool. I love how that's coming together. That's been fun. Chapters 48 and 49 were kind of insane and I love them. It was one of my favorite things I've read in The Wheel of Time because it got into like the futuristic side of things and the weird lore stuff. And it was Avienda's POV and she's one of my favorite characters in the Wheel of Time, especially of the women, but she wants to learn more about the glass pillars of Ruidian while she's there, but they're too complex for her to like analyze. So um, she decides to walk through them. That is sort of the purpose of her being there is her final sort of test as a wise one, ceremony of a wise one. In this chapter, she has three visions walking in and out of the, um, like through the glass pillars. The first vision is the point of view of a woman named Melidra, who is a scavenger killed by light bearers who refer to Melidra as she dies as Bloody Aiel. Um, Avienda is confused by this um, because the Aiel um, in history were not scavengers. So she's expecting to see visions of the past as she did when she first arrived. And she's like, we were never scavengers. Also, what is that light stick kind of thing? Like it's meant to be futuristic. I, they mention paved roads. The next vision she has is um, with the point of view of Norlesh, who's trying to trade with the Raven Empire, um, but she and her people are refused. And then as she's walking and traveling, she realizes that her baby has died on their journey. Avienda mourns this vision of the honorless Aiel. It's um, like they've been, you know, resorted to this sort of devastation. It's, it's really sad. It's just so... It just, 
is apparent to her that like these Aiel that she, she's watching are, are on her list. In the third vision, Tava's POV, she's defending an Aiel hold against people Avienda realizes are the Shan Chan in a scene from the future. And these light sticks are basically guns. They're basically uh, early gun designs, like muskets. So yeah, that is what happens in chapter 48. You can understand why I was like, whoa, that's like really cool. She's thinking of the future. Um, and that there is some like sci-fi sense to it, which I thought was super cool. But also it's very dark and very sad for her to watch her people fall apart and to realize that this is their future. Going on in chapter 49, her fourth vision um, is a point of view of did I write this? Ladolin, who is a wise one, a descendant of the dragon. She meets with other Aiel. Um, they note that the tower has fallen and they decide to retreat to the threefold land. Avienda is sort of shocked by the lack of and misunderstanding of honor in the future Aiel. In the fifth vision, Onkala is the POV. Um, she's Avienda's granddaughter. She's meeting with Elaine's descendant um, to show some attack plans that are coming from Ibadar, which would lead to Elaine's descendants people, so the Andorn people, fighting with the Shan Chan, which would introduce the Shan Chan to the dragon weapons, which would lead to them creating light sticks. And at this point, she is disgusted with her posterity, Avienda. So in her final vision, she has the point of view of her daughter, Padra. She attacks um, some Shan Chan who enter their borders after peace has been weighed, made with the wetlanders, but not with the Aiel. Padra and her siblings meet. They basically decide to engage in battle with the Shan Chan, um, basically to start a war. Um, and the Shanchan have not released their captive Aiel, which I'm like, why wouldn't they? I'm so tired of the Shanchan, okay? And then Avienda realizes she will have quadruplets with Rand, like Min said, which I'm like, ow? Like, is she gonna be okay? I'm not gonna question it too much, but yikes, girl. Anyway, and she leaves Ru Ruidian by the end of this chapter in this series of visions, determined to change the future of the Aiel for her posterity. In chapter 50, um, Brigitte shows Kyrie and Nobles the dragon weapons, and then Elaine has prisoners of the high seat brought before her. She strips their titles, which is like a shameful thing for them, and then offers Andorran estates to the Kyrian and visitors. And she offers some kind of land from the deals with Gildan, kind of intermingling her people and the Kyrian people. Um, Birgitta, Morghese, and Dylan discuss this political move. In chapter 51, Rand has Kalendor across his back. He sends some kind of encouragement to the Ashman who are loyal to Loghain, but also doesn't want to be trapped because he feels like things are up with time. He also shuts down Kedzwain calling him a boy. He's like, I am older than you because, you know, he's also loose there. Anyway, um, it's super cool. Amin is worried that Rand has changed with all the memories in his head, and Rand says that he feels like the most himself he's ever been, but things are different because Tam raised him, um, and he raised him right. And I love that piece because it just, again, shows the importance, and I talk about this all the time, of the fact that Tam is Rand's father and how much that has had an impact on him. Rand meets with borderland rulers who take turns slapping him, and then he answers a test question to prove himself, which they claim was a prophecy. In chapter 52, Elaine finally claims the sun throne, though Brigitte has to help dodge some assassination attempts, like a poison needle in her cushion seat. She says the coronation can wait. She instead gathers an army of all able men and willing women to fight. Um, she says the last battle's coming, that's more important. And then, we cut to Matt. He's talking with Sital Sitali? I don't know how to say her name. Sitali. And he's talking with her about his thoughts on Aes Sedai and nobles, using a very confusing boots metaphor. And to be honest, I feel like Matt is sometimes not quite written right by Sanderson. I think Sanderson writes like Wayne from Era 2 of Mistborn into Matt, or did. Uh, not that Wayne existed, but that's the vibe I'm getting of Matt. And he's just a little too silly sometimes and a little... I'm like, I just don't feel like Sanderson fully understood Matt. And then there's other parts where I'm like, oh, this is awesome. So I don't fully understand it. But he thinks about defeating the Finn and how he's going to do it. And then he leaves Varen's letter behind. In chapter 53, the Aes Sedai Pavara is ready to bond the dedicated that time will allow. She wants to get out of the Black Tower. Things are not right. Some of the men there are acting very strange, like they've got nothing behind the eyes. And the wall there is manned, so she can't even leave. Um, and the other Aes Sedai are like, no, we're not gonna leave yet. We cut to Perrin, who's leaving through a gateway to Marilor, the fields there, to join in the meeting between Rand and Egwene to discuss 
how things are going to go down. Um, and he says goodbye to Matt, who is taking a gateway created by one of the Ashaman, um, who will have a gateway prepared if Matt needs to return. Those opposing Rand with Egwene gather, but Perrin doesn't wish to oppose Rand as like his plan to break the seals first to make them stronger again makes sense to him, especially as a black blacksmith, which I thought was cool. And Matt, Tom, and Noel face the Tower of Genji. Um, Tom cuts, a, cuts the symbol um, in order to enter it. And they enter a very strange corridor. This is where things start to get awesome again at the end. They realize they must be in one of the three spires of the tower. And Eelfin shows up promising to guide them. So one of the foxes, the foxish, humanish people, um, he, pro it, he promises to guide them if they leave their iron, fire, and music behind. They kind of refuse and Matt kind of keeps him talking, distracts him while Tom plays the flute and puts the creature to sleep. Matt doesn't re realize he was speaking the old tongue with the creature because he never does. And then he proceeds to use his luck with the dice to decide where they're going to go. Chapter 54 is titled The Light of the World. Um, the three of them, between Tom, Noel, and Matt, find a room of shadows and they need to fight the Eelfin with iron and Eludra's light explosion in order to push past them. Matt spins until dizzy um, to allow himself to decide his next move and they move forward and arrive at a door. At this point, Matt has lost his dice. The, the Eelfin have stolen the dice, but they got past them. They enter what is called the Chamber of Bonds. Moraine floats there in white mist wearing the ivory bracelet that she had, the Angriol, and Matt tries to pull her out, but is like burned. It's like almost like acid mist. It's like hot, hot steam. Um, Tom manages to get her out despite the pain um, and wraps her in his gleaming cloak. Then the eight Eelfin reveal themselves on pedestals. Matt quiets his friends basically saying like, we have to make a deal with them. We have to abide by the pact we make. So we need to word this a certain way. The Eelfin say that a sacrifice must be made and Matt demands, he states his demands first, um, that there will be a way out, nothing blocking it. It will be direct a direct route and that the foxes won't attack. Um, he agrees to give up half the light of the world as he was told he would. Um, the Aelfin said that he would um, when he was last there. And so he, he agrees, bracing himself for what's about to happen. Tom is like, no, no, like, don't give yourself up. And Matt's being a hero. As, as he usually is, despite his denials of it. The Ilfin take Matt, and one of them uses its long nail ugh, to pull out his left eye, which is gross and awesome. Um, they feed off of his emotions of agony, and, and, and you find out later that him being a Tavaran gives them more to feed off of, to the point where they're almost drunk and unconscious on the floor, just useless. Um, and the three manage to take this moment to escape the room, not without... Matt grabbing his hat, of course. And he also is recognizing that saving Moraine must be incredibly important, that she must have, like, more to do. Um, Noel points out, as they're running, with their direct route ahead of them, feeling very chipper, that in what he understood of Matt's old tongue that he was using in making the deal with the eelfin, that Matt said that the foxes cannot harm them. But he said nothing of the snakes, aka the eelfin, and that's when they realize that the eelfin are approaching out of the shadows with bronze swords and they have to run. In chapter 56, Noel Noel's drumming is no longer soothing the eelfin, and so Matt throws one of the explosive cylinders from Aludra at them. They run. At some point, Matt has to take a turn carrying Moraine and realize as they must run in the direction of where the Aelfin are coming in order to get to where they need to go. Otherwise, they will just be chased away and killed. Noel offers to stay behind to buy them some time. <sighs> it's so, like, powerful and so sad that Noel's just like, I'll come along, I'll help. Like, he just joined in. Um, I was suspicious of Noel at first, and I had a right to be to a certain extent because he is a mythical figure, but not because he's not trustworthy. In the end, he yells toward Matt, if you ever meet a Malkier, you tell him that Jane Farstrider died clean. And it's very, very powerful and very, very sad. And obviously, I knew at some point that this man was Jane Farstrider, a man of legend. But, um, he dies very honorably. And Matt is thinking on um, Noel's heroism as Tom weeps and Matt's realizing, like, I'm no hero. Noel's a hero. At some point, they are then trapped in a room with the broken doorway and trying to figure out how to escape. They realize this is the end. Tom is playing his harp, which sort of soothes, soothes the elfin, but also comforts Moraine as Tom believes they are about to die. But Matt's thinking, thinking, he's like, 
Last time I made a deal, I asked for a few things, and my final ask was to be given a way out of this dang tower. And then they hanged me, and they gave me the Ashandari, his spear. And he realizes that the spear is the way out, so he uses it to cut a hole in the wall um, to escape. And it's like light breaks in. It's very powerful, last minute, awesome moment of him realizing this. And I loved it. Good Matt moment, right? Well-written Matt moment. As Tom and Maureen escape first, Matt tips his hat as he gets the heck out of there, um, ultimately defeating the Aelfin. In chapter 56, um, we switch point of view. It, this chapter is called Something Wrong. Ugh, love it. Um, Egwene meets with her coalition in the fields of Marilor. She's gathering people to oppose Rand, breaking the seals. She's wrong. That's what my belief is. I don't know. Anyway. Um, and then Gawain gets to see his mother alive, and it's a good moment. And then we cut to Andril, who's the Ashaman who... Um, is on sort of Logan's side at the Black Tower. He and his men cannot make gateways to flee and they're kind of stuck, so he meets with Pavara to plan his escape or to kind of see what they can do in chapter 57. This is the final chapter before the epilogue. The epilogue still has stuff though, so chapter 57 is titled A Rabbit for Supper. Matt celebrates outside the tower having escaped, um, but he becomes more sad after Tom explains to Moraine who Noel was and his heroism. She can barely light their fire as um, the um, elephant had fed off of her power. They allowed her to keep her bracelet on Griel, um, but that gave more power for them to feed off of. And then Matt informs her that Rand has healed the curse of the male half. And then in a moment that surprised all of us, Maureen asks Tom to marry her. I knew that they had a thing because of the internet, because spoilers, which is fine. And I'm okay with it. I totally see, like, how the vibe of who they are could work out, but there was, like, nothing there. And Matt is stunned. He's like, marriage? When did you guys fall in love? We were out in the woods on our little adventure. When did you have time to fall in love? And Tom literally says, like, you weren't paying enough attention. And I'm like, no, don't say that to me. That feels like you're telling me I wasn't paying attention. And the only reason I knew that these two had any anything going on was because of, like, Reddit. So... <laughs> Dang it, like, so I, this is one thing that I know that the show could do better is, like, the romance and, like, leading into it maybe a little bit easier. I really liked Nynaeve and Lan. I think those actors are great, but also their chemistry just like, kind of bleeds a little slower into it rather than being sudden declarations of love. But it's, like, very weird. Um, Moraine even is like, I won't uh, wear the Terran Griol if it makes me too powerful. I know that you've had a hard time with powerful women, which I'm like, yes, Tom has, but I just didn't like that. I was like, no, Moraine has stuff to do. I think she would prioritize that before she would prioritize marrying Tom and make him feel, making him feel safer, but not being as powerful. Because he knows he can trust her. I think he should. I think he should trust Moraine. But he's like, no, I would never ask you to do that, which is the right answer, but it shouldn't even have been a question in my opinion. So, and if you guys want to fight with me on that, that's totally fine. I'm a young woman reading The Will of Time. I'm going to have some complaints. That's okay. I love Moraine. So, yeah, anyway, I got blue auto on the test I took on the internet, so I'm defensive. Anyway, um, so she's very weak in the power on her own, but with the Angriel, she's like three times as powerful as she ever would have been. Matt steps aside to make Cairn for Noel, like in his honor, and then he wonders like, how am I going to fight without my eye? My depth of perception is off. He casually flings a knife behind him and kills a rabbit. And he's like, oh yeah, my luck. I don't need my eye. <laughs> we'll be fine. And then they have rabbit for dinner. That's the end almost of book 13. The epilogue is actually important and I don't understand why it's an epilogue, if I'm being honest. There's like a few things. There's like one thing that I'm like, yeah, epilogue transition. But this is like, like Perrin has an arc here. What the heck? So in the epilogue, there are a few POVs. The first one is Graindoll. She has failed to kill Perrin with the Trolloc army. Um, that was the trap that she laid before, talking to Slayer. And she is visited by um, the Mirdral Shadar, Shadar Haran. Okay. Um, and he says in his creepy Mirdral voice, because she cannot escape in time, he says, I shall not forget you, and you shall not forget that which comes next, which is spooky. She failed. Anyway, there's a lot of incentive for success for the Forsaken, and yet they lose a lot. Perrin forces life to be created while he's in the dream world, briefly forming a living pauper, but 
Hopper fades and is lifeless and he's very sad and so he decides to honor Hopper's last words which were to go find Boundless so he searches for the wolf. After seeing Boundless's visions of like human life and suffering, Perrin realizes this is not just a wolf, this is a- this person is a man. Um, he was Noam, a human we saw in the beginning of the series who sort of succumbed to his wolf form, but it was a choice. And now that Perrin realizes that the life of a wolf is a choice, it's about balance, it's about what you need, um, Perrin has more comfort there. And I just feel bad for him that his life was so hard that he chose the wolf life that it was more peaceful and more safe. We cut to Olver playing a game with Talmanis. Um, it's the Snakes and Foxes game, and he actually wins it, which is like, the game you don't win because oh we're special but he thinks over how he's going to kill the shido who killed his father he leaves to open baron's letter that he finds on matt's desk like i am his letter like messenger guy i need to read this even though he can barely read he reads some of it and is scolded by tom Manus, who's like this was not to be opened but then tom Manus reads it he's like oh, okay i'll read it and it's very important and basically varen left matt that letter said like hey wait like if i don't show up you need to open this letter um, but if you don't leave it open, you know, don't worry about it. <sighs> but she basically thought the curiosity would get the best of him, but she forgot about Matt's stubbornness, so Matt refuses to open the letter. And Varen is obviously not alive to tell him what's going to happen. She basically left a letter telling him that there's a way gate in Camelin that is not as safe as they think it is, and that Trollocs will be attacking Camelin through the way gate if they don't destroy the way gate entirely. Um... They walk out to see that the city of Camelin is literally on fire, and she tried to warn them. And then Talmanis and Olver like prep for battle, and Olver's like got his knife. He's like, I'm not gonna, yeah, I'm gonna fight, which is adorable and also makes me nervous. We see the POV of Barika, I believe, who is a merchant. I didn't fully understand this part, and I will later, and maybe I'll look back on it. Um, but stumbles into the blood the blight actually and comes across Aiel looking people who reveal they have sharp teeth and he's like those are not Aiel. We cut to Rand who dreams and prepares for the following day and while in the dream world he hears a woman screaming. He follows the voice and finds basically Lanfear um, but not as he knew her as Lanfear but remembers her from before and she's asking and screaming for help but is dragged into a pit. It was really dark and I was like Lanfear's scary and she's evil, but like also they have this connection because of his past life. And she is like genuinely terrified. And I think it's really cool to make a villain very, very scared so that the upcoming villain is extra scary. <laughs> That's what we see with Rand. And then the final scene is Lan with an army of 12,000 men, which sounds like a lot until you realize that he's at Tarwin's Gap facing 150,000 of the you know, Trollocs and Murdral of the dragon spawn. He's, he's facing down 150 of th a thousand of those when he's got 12,000 of his own. So anyway, Lan is in trouble and I worry for him. That is the end of the epilogue. That is the end of book 13 of The Will of Time. That is the end of my voice for today. I did not expect to take an hour to film this video and I need to go eat some pizza. So that's what I'm going to go do. Um, I really loved this book. If you can't tell, I got very excited by certain scenes. I love the Tower of Gen Genji. Genji? You can correct me. I loved that stuff. Um, I love the dream world stuff. I love Avienda's visions. I thought that was so, so cool. I love Avienda. I think she's pretty awesome. And I love the Wheel of Time. Thank you guys for watching. I'm just gonna say a quick goodbye and let you know I'll be back. I will start up book 14 soon. I do tend to read books in between just to sort of like cleanse my palate for big books. Um, it's not the Wheel of Time's fault. It's my attention span's fault. And also I read all kinds of books. So if you like storytelling and to learn about it with me, um, please subscribe if you feel like it. Um, thanks for watching. I will see you guys another time with another video.